So hello everyone, my name is Felix Leach. I'm an Associate Professor of Engineering Science uh, here at the University of Oxford. Um, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this taster lecture. Um, what I hope to do over the next half an hour or so is just talk you through some of my research, um, some of the work that students have been doing here at the University of Oxford recently, um, and talk about how it's really relevant today. So I'm gonna be talking about air pollution, how it forms from vehicles, um, how it moves through our environment, and then most recently, what's happened since the lockdowns associated with the coronavirus pandemic to air pollution here in Oxford. So we're going to start out with a little bit of uh, work for you to do. You're going to have to tell me what you think. We're going to look at where emissions come from, some things that have gone well. We're then going to move on to, as I said, uh, thinking about the lockdown. Um, we're going to talk about particulate matter emissions and why they're important. Uh, we're going to talk about real driving emissions and then some maps and some suggestions for what we might do next. So here's the bit where I want you to do something. So when I give this lecture live and in person, which of course, sadly, I can't do this year, um, the first question I always ask you is, is air quality in the UK getting better or worse? We read about the air quality crisis. But I want to know if you think it's getting better or worse. So you can see here on the screen, there's two ways of letting me know. You can tweet me or you can send me an email. It doesn't have to be much, just yes, it's getting worse or no, it's getting better. So yes or no is fine, but I am really interested to know what you think. So I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to do that now before I move on and reveal the answer. It is going to be 30 seconds, so you really might as well email me or tweet me right now. I do want to know what you think. I'm still here. I'm still waiting for you to send me an email or send me a tweet to find out what you think. Is air quality in the UK getting better or getting worse right now? So five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. So. When I gave this talk in the last open day, so this is September 2019, this is what the people who attended that session thought. There was about 200 of them. 52% told me it was getting worse and 48% told me it was getting better. I quite like those numbers. It reminds me of something else that happened uh, about four years ago now. Um, the answer is it's getting better. And it has been since about the 1970s. So uh, this plot here shows uh, various pollutants in, in the atmosphere in the UK between 1970 and 2014. This, this type of analysis doesn't take place that often. So 2014 was the most recent data I could find for you. Uh, and it shows that NOx emissions, uh, they're a type of emission associated particularly with um, causing heart and lung problems. Uh, they've showed a 69% reduction since 1970. Uh, and you can see there the sort of the, uh, the the reddish line you can see here on the screen. That's the NOx emissions. And they're down about 70 percent, 69, 70 percent. Uh, two different types of particulates. So PM10 are um, very small particles, uh, less than 10 microns in diameter. And PM2.5 are even smaller particles, less than 2.5 microns in diameter. Both of those show over 70 percent reduction, 72 and 76 percent reductions, uh, respectively. And then finally, um, sulfur dioxide, SO2, shows a 95% reduction since the 1970s. Uh, that's particularly associated with acid rain, uh, with forming other particles in the atmosphere, and with smogs that um, perhaps the parents watching this video might be more familiar with uh, than those of you who are thinking about applying here to Oxford. And all of these projections continue to show a steep decline. So Although we have become much more aware about air pollution, air quality over the past five years, probably associated with particularly with the Dieselgate emission scandal um, about five years ago, um, actually, things are getting a lot better. There have been substantial reductions in all major pollutants between since basically since the 1970s. However, that doesn't stop us being worried about it, and we should continue to be worried about it. But as engineers, we need to look at the data and understand what's really causing it. So you can see here on the screen just a number of uh, headlines from the past couple of years I've pulled out. Um, there's some from The Guardian, Daily Mail, etc. Uh, and it says uh, the lethal legacy of Dash for Diesel. Air pollution is killing 40,000 people a year in the UK. That's a really serious, serious problem. But is it just because of diesel cars? 
So for those of you who are really interested, I do uh, recommend this Winton Centre at Cambridge. I probably shouldn't be promoting them in an open day lecture for Oxford, but nevertheless, it's a really good article uh, that you can see there at the top right hand corner of the screen. Uh, if you're interested in where that figure comes from and some of the uncertainties around that figure. But it's really not just diesel cars. So this is looking at uh, what we call the London Atmospheric Emissions Inventory. So this is where all the various pollutants in the air in London come from. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but as of 2020, uh, the no NOx emissions in London are as likely to have come from a vehicle as they are from your gas boiler in your house. So you can see here, we've got the uh, domestic gas uh, is these bits in red here, and the transportation uh, emissions are these, are these yellow ones here. And you can see that transport now makes up less than 50% of the NOx emissions in London. Um, it's still a lot. We should still continue to improve that. But the transport part of that graph has showed quite a big decline since um, the early part of this millennium, whereas all of the other parts of that are showing roughly constant emissions. And a lot of that is associated with industry and with burning of gas, both domestically and not domestically. So if we want to think about reducing NOx, we need to not only think about our diesel cars, but also all the other sources of NOx emissions, because actually the diesels and the other forms of transportation have been getting a lot better. Everything else has been staying still. So that's a bit of an introduction to the background of the problem. But what we really want to know is what causes emissions? If we want to help sort of clear them up and stop them, we should first understand where they come from. So I'm going to start with some very, very basic uh, combustion science that hopefully any of you with a physics or chemistry um, background will be able to follow. So the first thing we're going to do is just take some ideal combustion. So we're going to take some uh, ideal fuel. So this is CXHY. That's just any form of hydrocarbon fuel. It could be natural gas, it could be petrol, it could be diesel, it could be a biofuel, any type of fuel that burns. And we add oxygen. And in this reaction, we end up with carbon dioxide and water. Plus, of course, energy, which is what helps our vehicles to go forwards, that heats our homes, etc, etc. Unfortunately, we don't have oxygen just hanging around on its own. So we have to burn, we typically burn things in air. So we have to modify our combustion equation to take that into account. So we've still got our ideal uh, fuel, whatever it may be, uh, and we've still got the oxygen. But because oxygen exists in air rather than on its own, we now add in as an approximation, we're engineers, we're always making approximations, 79 over 21 nitrogen. So what this number here tells us is that I'm approximating air as being roughly 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. There are other things in air too, I acknowledge that, but if we make this approximation, we get a pretty good idea of what air really is. And that leaves us with carbon dioxide as before. That's still a greenhouse gas, we still need to be concerned about that. Water and nitrogen. So the nitrogen in this equation just sort of flips through from one side to the other. However, I bet you were going to watch this lecture and think you were going to get some really interesting insights. Well, here's a perhaps obvious one for you, but it's important. Combustion is hot. That sounds really obvious, but it has really important consequences for emissions. Combustion also happens quickly. If it happened really slowly, our cars wouldn't go anywhere, our houses would never get hot, and that would be a real problem for us. So because combustion is hot and happens quickly, we end up with this type of equation. So the left hand side of it, as you can see, is still the same. We've still got our fuel. We've still got the oxygen. We've still got the 79 over 21 nitrogen because we're burning in air. And we've still got the carbon dioxide, the water and the nitrogen. But now, because it happens quickly, we've got carbon monoxide. That's where some of the oxidation of the fuel into carbon dioxide is stopped too soon. We've also got uh, oxides of nitrogen, NOx, typically NO and NO2, but we uh, typically show that as NOx because we don't quite know the proportion of those two gases. NOx happens because combustion is hot. So some of the nitrogen in the air reacts with some of the oxygen in the air to form NOx. NOx doesn't only form in combustion, you also get atmospheric formation of it from things like lightning strikes where there's a lot of energy in the air but almost all of the NOx we get in the UK is formed from a combustion process of some sort. Then, much as the carbon monoxide is a fuel that's on its way to carbon dioxide but stopped too soon, C is carbon on its own. That's fuel that uh, is stopped even earlier in the oxidation process. Then CXHY is various forms of unburnt fuel. It needn't necessarily be the same as the input fuel, although of course sometimes it is. 
And this helps us understand where our emissions start to come from. So we've got the greenhouse gas emission, carbon dioxide. We've got carbon monoxide, NOx, um, carbon on its own, and that's sort of short form for a particulate matter emission. So this is a little soot particle or something similar. Uh, we've got unburnt fuel. And all of these things we consider pollutant emissions. And all of them are bad for us in their own way. Carbon monoxide is toxic. It replaces oxygen in your red blood cells and uh, in high doses can kill you. Uh, NOx is associated, as I said before, with uh, heart and lung problems, causes asthma. Um, particulate matter emissions are particularly serious um, because they can cross the uh, blood air barrier in your lungs and get into your bloodstream. So they can cause all sorts of problems. And they've even been associated with diseases such as Alzheimer's. Finally, unburnt fuel. Well, you wouldn't drink fuel, or perhaps I should say you shouldn't drink fuel. Um, so breathing it in in unburnt form is also obviously bad for you. Uh, most hydrocarbons are toxic in, in some form or other. Uh, and there are, of course, other things that come out as well, uh, which I could talk for hours on, but that's probably not the point of today's lecture. So how do we regulate it? Well, for a long time, we've had emissions legislation in Europe that restricts how much of these emissions can come out of vehicles. Uh, and as you can see, um, from the year 2000 onwards, it's been getting progressively more and more strict. And indeed, on the particulate matter side, it's now very, very close to zero. Uh, it's 0.005 uh, milligrams per kilometre now, which is very, very low levels. And NOx is becoming increasingly strict as well. And there's a forthcoming Euro 7 emissions legislation, uh, which will sit somewhere down here. And I often wonder whether actually our perception of vehicles is more associated with the very first emission standards back in 1992, which on this axis would be all the way up here. That's not to say that things are perfect now, and indeed things like the Dieselgate scandal showed us that sometimes emissions legislation doesn't work. But overall, the trends have been really positive about reducing emissions from vehicles. Uh, and indeed, a lot of this reduction in emissions from vehicles is why we saw those uh, reductions um, in pollutants in our air uh, back on the first couple of slides I showed you. It's not the only reason, of course, but it is strongly associated with that. And those of you uh, watching this who have either come across very old cars or are old enough to remember older cars will know that um, you can today smell a sort of classic car on the motorway long before you see it. Um, and, and in modern cars, you simply couldn't do that. And that's partly because of these very great strides we've seen in reducing emissions. Now, I said before that real emissions um, sometimes didn't quite track the emissions legislation. I'm going to be talking about that uh, in a little bit in some of the work we've been doing here in Oxford. But we have seen, particularly since Dieselgate, the real emissions have really started to match the legislated emissions because companies um, have seen the consequences if they don't. You know, Volkswagen executives went to jail for their role in cheating the emissions legislation. And so today, you know, in the last three or four years, things have transformed. So what I'm showing on the right is some data from RDAC. It's a German ind independent testing company. It's a little bit like the AA in the UK, for those of you who are British watching this. And this is measuring the NOx emissions from what we call RDE. RDE stands for Real Driving Emissions. And you can see for a variety of vehicles, some incredibly low numbers of NOx emissions. You know, this Mercedes C220D giving zero milligrams per kilometre. The, the Opel Astra or Vauxhall Astra in the UK giving one and the BMW 520D also giving one. The only vehicle that really would be of a concern to me is this Honda Civic, which is actually still just breaking the legislation requirements. I'm not quite sure what's going on there at Honda. I think they should probably be looking into that. Uh, but all of these other vehicles are giving incredibly low levels of emissions. And that's something you wouldn't have seen even three or four years ago. So there has been a real step change. And it shows that when uh, the will is there, the engineering really now can almost entirely eliminate these emissions from these vehicles. And this is on real driving. This is not on some kind of uh, test that's not representative. This is an independent company buying these cars or renting these cars probably and just driving them around with some kit on the back to measure the emissions that come out of them. This is what we will really see as we drive through our towns and cities. Now, we're all here because of COVID-19. That's the reason I'm giving this lecture into my laptop. This is the reason why you're watching it on a screen rather than having the opportunity to come and visit us here in Oxford. But nevertheless, it's had a big impact on pollution. You've no doubt seen some of these headlines. I just picked out a few today to show you. 
Um, but Bristol pollution is down. Coronavirus lockdowns have caused drops in air pollution across the world. Um, all of these different um, articles, um, I in particular wanted to just highlight this one from The Guardian, showing that um, air pollution does not affect everyone equally. There's been uh, a lot of data to show that it affects um, BAME communities here in the UK more. And that's uh, partly because of uh, the socioeconomic status of these communities and partly other factors. But it affects everyone, but not necessarily in equal amount. And it's really interesting to see all these articles because actually, if you read closely, they're only talking about one emission. So if you look at this Guardian article on the left, the air quality benefits of lockdown continue. This is the only one that in the headline, or at least in the, the sort of uh, the subheading, uh, shows that actually what they're talking about is there is a 31% decrease in nitrogen dioxide levels. Now, as you remember from the first couple of slides I showed you, nitrogen dioxide is an important pollutant but it's not the only pollutant. And this is where I think we need to be quite careful. We keep talking about pollution, but as we've just seen from our ideal look at combustion and emissions, there's no such thing as pollution on its own. Pollution is a sort of soup of various uh, things that are bad for us. And by only focusing on one, in this case, nitrogen dioxide, which has been in the news a lot for the last four or five years because of that was the pollutant that was being cheated in the Dieselgate scandal, we're losing a lot of information. So what I've been doing here in Oxford is I've been measuring the air quality across the city. So uh, initially, this project, which started uh, at the very beginning of this year, was intended to measure the impact of something called the zero emission zone. So Oxford City Council is saying that um, by the end of this year, in the initial plan, uh, vehicles would have to be uh, zero emitting, so an electric car or similar, to travel on certain streets. And those streets are shown in this map on the right of the slide in coloured in red. And there would be quite strict requirements about emissions in this much larger zone covered in green that covers almost all of the centre of Oxford. For those of you interested, uh, the engineering department is uh, just under the corner of where it says Parks Road up here. And Keeble College, which is my college, is, is just to the south of that in here. So it covers most of the colleges in the city centre. Um, and I introduced this project to gather some background data before um, this intervention was introduced later in 2020. Now, as it happens, uh, this intervention has been pushed back because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but my aim is to install 18 air quality sensors measuring not only particulate matter and NOx, but also carbon monoxide and ozone, uh, both of which are other important pollutants uh, across Oxford. I was installing these from sort of January of this year, and I managed to get eight in before lockdown hit. And of course, it became impossible to do any field work of this type in Oxford. Um, and you can see where they are in this map on the right. So, so they're dotted through Oxford. I've got some on these red streets that um, uh, will be zero emissions vehicles at some point to be determined in the future, probably in 2021, uh, including new in Hall Street that's mounted on St. Peter's College, Ship Street that's mounted on Jesus College, uh, the high street sensor is mounted on All Souls College. Uh, the plane, which is a big roundabout just um, outside of the green zone, is mounted on a Magdalen College building. Um, the Said Business School is a big university building. Hythe Bridge Street, that's on Worcester College. And then St Giles, uh, which is actually not mounted on a college building, but is uh, right opposite St John's College. So we've got these sensors um, across Oxford. Um, and I got eight of them in before lockdown. But of course, lockdown has offered a huge natural experiment opportunity because this experiment is effectively what happens if we remove all of the cars, buses and lorries from Oxford. Traffic in Oxford, just like everywhere else in the UK, has dropped massively during lockdown. So we can then examine what the effect of actually just removing all vehicles or almost all vehicles would be from Oxford. So let's have a look at what we found. So I'm going to show you some results from this high street site. So it's number 552. This is on All Souls College, right opposite University College, on one of the busiest streets in, in Oxford. It's full of buses on a typical day. And here's what we found. So uh, you can see I'm showing you data from about the 27th of January. And the way this works is I've got three pollutants I'm showing you here. NO, which is nitrogen monoxide or nitrous oxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide in, in the sort of orange squares, and then PM10. So this is particulate matter smaller than 10 microns. And these are the sort of yellow diamonds. The grey bars here show how the readings vary over the course of a day. And then each point is a single day. 
So basically I've taken an hour measurements each hour of the day and then average those. And then we've got the average in the middle here. And then the, the sort of the gray bar that you can see shows how much that measurement varied over the course of the day, each of those hourly measurements. And you can see I've got about two and a bit months of data, uh, about two months of data before lockdown hit. And then I'm showing you data up until I recorded this lecture. So until the weekend of the 21st, 22nd of June, uh, right there at this end. Now, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see some pretty clear trends. So NO um, is showing a pretty steep decline almost as soon as lockdown hit. These are these blue circles. And you can see that it's remained very, very low throughout lockdown. And then at the start of June, as lockdown has perhaps started to ease slightly, the NO has risen slightly. And NO is a pollutant we associate strongly with combustion. Uh, it's very closely correlated to the number of vehicles that pass a point. And so this is what we'd expect to see. But NO2, that's what happens to NO when it oxidizes in the atmosphere. Um, but NO2 has a number of sources, not just vehicles. It can also be associated with, for example, agriculture and spreading of ammonia on manure on fields. Uh, and you can see, yep, it's showing some decrease. There's probably 50% or thereabouts decrease between before lockdown and after lockdown. On the other hand, the particulate matter emissions, this is the PM10, are actually probably showing a slight increase during lockdown. So although we can safely say that the NO emissions are substantially reduced during lockdown, actually the particulate matter emissions are increased during lockdown. And we can take some averages to show this. So I'm now comparing the roadside sites, so this is on the high street, and the background site. So we've got a site a long way away from roads to try and measure some of the more atmospheric effects that we see in the air pollution. And you can see that the roadside is about 50% decreased here. Um, but the background is pretty much constant for NO2. So really your exposure is only reduced if you spend all your time hanging out at the roadside or in a car. And the, the particulate matter, so PM10 and PM2.5, are both showing increases here, right? And that's associated entirely with increases in the background. So the roadside effect of particulate matter emissions is almost negligible. All of the changes are being driven by the background. And indeed, the highest uh, event of particulates this year was on the 9th of April. So why does this happen? So we need to understand that in Oxford, only about 17% of particulate matter emissions of less than 2.5 microns are caused by transport. And it's 14% for those less than 10 microns. Air pollution is hugely weather dependent. And actually, April and May were quite unusual in the UK. They were very, very hot and they were very, very still. What I mean by still was there was almost no wind. And wind is actually very beneficial for air pollution. It mixes things up and carries it away. So because we had very little wind and quite warm weather, we actually saw some surprisingly high levels of air pollution driven by the weather. So we need to be very careful when we're making comparisons that we're not just looking at the effect of the weather rather than the effect of the lockdown. And what caused this increase in particulate matter emissions in particular? Well, like I said before, agricultural spreading, spreading manure, that if you can smell it, that's probably because it's there in a particle of some form or another. Um, a lot of wood and garden fires, as more people spent time at home and uh, um, there were fewer council collections, we saw quite a big increase in wood burning stove usage and bonfires in people's gardens. And then there was also what we call transport. So there were some industrial emissions from, from Europe that were actually brought over by gentle winds. And then because the winds were so low, they didn't disperse at all. So that a lot of that sort of external um, uh, transport or importing of pollution also went on. So we've seen that these particulates actually increased. And I just want to highlight that maybe these are a bit of a forgotten problem. So a particulate is really the smaller it is, the worse it is for you. Um, so it enters your body through the nose and mouth as you breathe. Um, your um, sort of the uh, little hairs in your nose and then your mucus catches quite a lot of the bigger particles, but the smaller ones carry on down. And indeed they can cross, as I said before, the, the air blood barrier in the lungs. And once they get into the blood, where do they go? Well, they go straight to the heart. And that's why in particular, they're associated with quite a lot of cardiovascular problems. And when we think about the the deaths that might be caused by air pollution, that 40,000 figure I quoted before is perhaps better expressed as being, well, particulate matter emissions accounts for between five and 60,000 early deaths in the UK every year. And NO2, which as I saw before, has been the focus of all of our concerns about air quality, 
is actually only responsible between 9,500 and 38,000 early deaths a year. So particulates are actually more dangerous for you, but we don't spend that much time thinking about them. So how small are these particles? Well, what I've got here is uh, two things that you might be familiar with. So we've got some, some sand from a beach and a human hair. And uh, a human hair is between 50 and 70 microns in diameter. A PM10, so if it's 50 micron hair, uh, you'll get five of those uh, per hair. And then you'll get four PM2.5, so these are less than 2.5 microns, per PM10. So if you remember this kind of red sized particle here, these little red dots for a PM2.5, if I then scale that <clears throat> to the size of a particle which comes out of an engine, so that's these particles down here. So these are kind of between 50 and 100 nanometers in diameter. Suddenly you see the scale, or perhaps lack of scale, of the problem. So we're thinking about particles that are a thousand times bigger than these teeny tiny particles that we're not even counting. And we know that these smallest particles will be the one, ones that can get into our lungs and then into our bloodstream. So what are we doing about it in Oxford? Well, my research, which I'm going to show you a little bit of now, just in the last part of this talk, um, has been focusing on very, very small particles. So these are particles that are smaller than 23 nanometers. And indeed, the European emissions legislation is now moving towards 10 nanometers because of a recognition of these very, very small particles. So bear in mind, a 10 nanometer particle is a thousand times smaller than a 10 micron particle. So that just gives you an idea of the scale. Um, I've also been doing some work that I'll show you on fast driving emissions uh, to help identify pollution hotspots, and then some local air quality modeling and measurement. Uh, for example, uh, which side of the bus stop should I stand to minimize my exposure to air pollution? So I'll show you some of that with an excellent student project work. So talking a little bit about the fast driving emissions from buses. So uh, we instrumented up two buses. Uh, here they are, uh, a sort of slightly older bus at the top that was a hybrid and a newer bus at the bottom. And with some very, very fast instruments, so this is an instrument that has what we call a time response of two milliseconds. So an input change to that instrument will be registered by that instrument within two milliseconds. So very, very fast. And we log a lot of engine parameters. And then we log some very, very high definition GPS as well as dash cam footage. We power it all off a 12 volt battery. And you can see here, uh, this is a, a colleague of mine, Jamie, from a company called Cambustion, who makes this kit. Um, looking at uh, the pollution that's coming out of a bus in service. So these are buses with passengers on. And what can we do? Well, first thing to say is we're logging the GPS very, very accurately to about 0.1 centimetres. And that means that we can get an accuracy on where things were emitted, so where pollutants were emitted, to about 30 centimetres. And these two um, uh, pictures here just show you quite how accurate the differential GPS that we're using is. So you can see here on the right, um, a bus pulling up to a bus stop, there's a little bit of a pause while the bus takes on passengers and so on, and then moving off. So we can tell you, for example, what lane of the road you're driving in. Uh, also, the first time we did this, we always learn from our mistakes as engineers. Uh, we were driving along this road here. You can see these sort of uh, yellowy orange dots showing emissions. And then suddenly the signal stops and there's this just big accumulating dot right here in the middle of the road. What happened? Well, the GPS aerial on the roof of the bus was knocked off by this tree. And in fact, the GPS is so accurate, we could pinpoint exactly which tree and retrieve the aerial straight away. So you've seen a little bit of the capabilities of the GPS. And when we convolve that with these very, very fast emissions analyzers, as I said, we can get pollution to within about uh, 30 centimeters. And that enables us to build pollution maps of Oxford as the bus is driving around. So what you're gonna see here is uh, this is a map of the City 5 bus route in Oxford, which runs between the city centre in the sort of top left and Blackbird Lees, which is a big housing estate uh, in South East Oxford. And you can see here, we can zoom in <coughs> and get very, very high definition results of exactly where emissions happened. And how these maps work is the sort of darker purpley colours are very, very high emissions and the sort of pale white colours are very, very low emissions. So you can see here that what happened is, slightly strangely, the bus changed from driving on the left-hand side of the road here to driving on the right-hand side of the road. And then something happened which caused very, very high emissions, and then it pulled back onto the left-hand side of the road. What was this? Well, it turns out there were some gas works on this road at this time. So there was one of those really irritating kind of one-way road works with the stop-go signs. So the bus actually stopped here for some period of time. They had to pull out, drive on the wrong side of the road, heading from right to left as you look at the screen, 
And that associated stopping and then pulling away caused very, very high levels of emissions that are entirely associated with the roadworks. It also means if you live in these two or three houses here, the emissions are really concentrated outside your house in a way that they're not if you live in the houses sort of three or four doors down either way. And that's what the resolution that some of this work can really tell us. We can also look at dash cam footage and integrate that with the emissions. So what you're going to see here is a bus pulling away from a bus stop on a road called the Cowley Road in South East Oxford. And you can see here the bus pulls away and you've got the emissions here in this blue line here. And just the act of pulling away from the bus stop has given a really, really big emission, which is, of course, left behind at the bus stop, exactly where the passengers have sat waiting for the following bus. So with this type of approach, we can then build these maps and understand what is causing the pollution and maybe what we can do to try and mitigate it without having to wait for new technology, but just by driving on our roads a bit differently or um, you know, uh, treating the technology slightly differently, maybe slightly less aggressive driving. And so we discovered all sorts of interesting things such as going uphill and downhill, buses actually had very, very low emissions, but while negotiating parked cars, speed bumps and things like that, the buses had very, very high emissions. This is some work from my colleagues at Cambustion again, showing the same sort of idea, but this time in Cambridge. And you look at this map of just a route around central Cambridge and the blue areas are very, very low emissions. And then again, the sort of dark red colors are very, very high emissions. And one area imme immediately springs to mind, which is this area that you can see the sort of bottom left of the map. What is causing this extraordinarily high level of emissions in this area of the map? Well, zooming in as this very, very high definition um, uh, technique allows us to do, shows that the emissions are not even constant in this area. They're kind of pulsing, they're coming and going. And again, if you live out in this house here, you've got a lot of emissions. But if you live in this house here, there are far fewer emissions. What causes it? Well, it turns out that road you just saw is full of speed bumps. And if you think about those of you who drive, the sort of braking and acceleration associated with going over speed bumps, it turns out they massively concentrate our pollution. And so this is the type of work we've been doing recently in Oxford to understand emissions. But I want to highlight now a student project. So this is a fourth year student of mine, Sam, uh, who's just about to graduate. And he's used some of the input data that I've just showed you to model what happens to this pollution as it disperses through the atmosphere. So he can model it down to about 10 centimetres. This is looking at NO2, so nitrogen dioxide only. Um, and we then went out in, in the streets of Oxford and took some roadside measurements every five metres. So trying to mimic what we saw on the buses, but at the roadside to validate this model. And you can see he takes a variety of inputs, not only the local emissions, but long term and short term trends. We need to take into account the winds, turbulence, dispersion caused by passing traffic or houses or whatever. Then we need to model the sensors so that you can see these here. So we've got these smaller handheld ones and these slightly larger, more capable devices. And then look at how the data is sampled um, and take into account a number of errors and so on in that. And what he's been able to do in this, in this great project is actually start to look at how these emissions disperse through the environment and begin to answer the question, what side of the bus stop should I stand? So. You just watch this video, these sort of red um, boxes here are, are models of vehicles. And then you can see the pollution coming out of the exhaust pipes uh, uh, in this sort of blue and, and, and purple and, and red colours. Um, and there's a number of check parameters, such as the turbulence from the vehicles and taking some cross sections across the road and so on. But what you can see if you look at this top left image in this video is the plumes of pollution coming out of the exhaust and then very slowly dispersing in the atmosphere. And this can help us then understand, and you can see this sort of zoomed in version uh, up here. Your exposure to pollution really depends on whether you're standing half a metre to the left or the right. You know, five metres, ten metres, it's not much to stop you from breathing in this really, really high level bit of pollution to this almost non-existent level of pollution here. So this is just an example of if you do come here to Oxford, some of the stuff that you could be doing by the time you get to the fourth year, some really exciting novel work looking at um, how pollution disperses through the environment and many, many more things. So I promise just a little look forwards at the end to what I think might be coming next. And I think one of the big things is going to be we need to stop thinking about pollution as just coming from combustion, because the short answer is it really is not the dominant category anymore. So this is looking at these 
uh, 2.5 and smaller micron particles. And you can see from road transport already by 2020, the exhaust is by no means the largest contributor to pollution because of all the focus we've had on reducing exhaust emissions. Now we've got particles from the tyres as, um, as they wear, from the brakes as you brake sharply, that emits particles as well, and just from um, chucking up particles and dust from the road. All of these are now bigger sources than the exhaust pollutants. And indeed, this may be a bigger problem we might think going forwards, because I think we should ask the question, do I care what, em I, what emitted the pollution that I'm breathing in? I certainly don't. It may not have even been a vehicle. So going forwards, we need to think about technology neutrality. And I need to introduce the concept that electric vehicles will emit particulate matter too, because electric vehicles have tires, electric vehicles drive on the roads. Electric vehicles don't quite use their brakes in the same way because they can use regenerative and rheostatic braking. But if you look at this plot here, this is a plot from the European Union from about three or four years ago, showing that um, this dotted line is the limit of emissions from combustion, but already the tyres and the road wear are substantial contributions, even if we neglect the brake wear, although there will be some of that from electric vehicles. But the problem is, as you move from a small to a medium car, that's increasing the mass of the vehicle and batteries in vehicles are heavy. So you might expect, a, you know, say, a, 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 you know, a VW Polo sized vehicle to emit this type of level of um, particulates from the tyres and brakes and so on. Uh, but as you put batteries in it, it might get heavier and move to this type of vehicle, which point we're actually going to see an increase in the particulate matter emissions. So we need to be very careful. Electric vehicles will not eliminate our pollution problem. So thanks for your attention. What have we looked at today? We've looked at the fact that air quality has improved dramatically, and I'm looking forward to receiving your tweets and emails telling me what you think about that. We've looked at what causes emissions from vehicles. We've also looked at what happens to air pollution. Yes, there have been some decreases in some pollutants, but there have also been increases in others, and we need to really look carefully at this to understand it properly. We've talked about particulate matter emissions and discussed that they may be a forgotten problem. We've looked at fast real driving emissions. We've looked at the emissions maps that we can generate and mapping them. And I've shown you a project from one of my uh, just graduated fourth year students. And we've looked a little bit about what the future might hold. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for watching this lecture. I'm sorry I've not been able to meet you all in person, but do please get in touch. The, my research group website's up there if you're interested. Uh, you can email me or tweet me. I'd be delighted to hear from you. And I look forward to welcoming you to Oxford very, very soon. Thanks for listening.